Welcome to The Theory Creep. I'm The Theory Creep, and today we're coming to you from a theater, just uh, straight up looking down at a stage. So I was just watching a lecture on Derrida, and the lecturer um, summarized a pretty conventional Derridian position very, very succinctly. Uh, maybe I'll throw the, uh, the clip up here. Principally, in upgrammatology, he deconstructed structuralism by arguing that the relation of the signified and signifier is not a neutral coupling, but privileges the speaking voice over the written artifact. And the, the issue for Derrida was this privileging of speech over writing. And it turns out this privileging of speech over writing for Derrida is also a privileging of presence over absence. And we're going to talk about that when we do our, our deconstruction. So this, this privileging of presence over absence he talks about in several ways. One is through this term logocentrism. Now logocentrism is this sense that speech is first and foremost and the dominant mode of discourse. And logocentrism, Derrida is going to tell us, is in fact the, the key piece to the history of metaphysics in the Western philosophical tradition. It's a tradition that will always privilege speech over writing because it privileges presence over absence. This summary of Derrida's ideas that he's undermining the privileging of speech over text is really at the core of what I'm trying to do with this channel. When I look at criticism of the internet by modern journalists or cultural theorists or philosophers, I see a very strong privileging of the material over the virtual. And as someone who has studied a lot of Derrida and a lot of other postmodern philosophers and has really enjoyed post-structuralism and, and how it's influenced my relationship with the world, I'm kind of frustrated to see this privileging of materiality in modern uh, cultural theory and philosophy. I kind of thought we were over that. So Derrida gives us some tools that we can use to undermine this privileging of the material over the virtual. They apply really well to a discussion of online communities and online togetherness. Because there's this assumption in modern readings of online communities like YouTube or Facebook or Instagram that they're fake, that they're uh, lesser than a material relationship, that it's more real to connect with someone in the real world than in the digital world. So this got me thinking about Faye Alberti, who we've already talked about in an earlier video. I'll, I'll throw a, a link up there. Now, Alberti is talking about loneliness, and she's also privileging materiality over the virtual. So it just kind of strikes me that like, if we have this new massive way of connecting with each other online, and we all seem so lonely all the time, maybe we have the solution to this problem right in front of us. Maybe if we didn't value material relationships more than virtual relationships, we wouldn't be alone all the time. So as Alberti is talking about self-presentation on the internet, she refers to a mid-century sociologist named Goffman Irving, who uh, wrote a book called The Presentation of the Self in Everyday Life. It's a sociological study of performance in everyday relationships and performances of the self. Unsurprisingly, Alberti uses this as an example of how online relationships are performance-based and therefore representational, i.e. they repeat something. You have the original material world, and then you have the representation of it in the digital virtual realm. So right off the bat, Irving reinforces this privileging. He reinforces this hierarchy. He says that he will not make light of the inadequacies of the, of the performance model. And he goes on to say that the stage presents things that are make-believe, and presumably life presents things that are real and sometimes not well rehearsed. I mean, stages also present things that aren't well rehearsed, and in life we often present quite intensely rehearsed presentations of ourselves. So I'm not sure that that discounts the validity of presentations. I think an important word in this quote is presumably. Irving is questioning the legitimacy of his position. He's saying that maybe 
presentations are legitimate. So here Irving is privileging real life over the performance model. He's saying that the stage and real life are distinct things. I think the performance model is a much better way of looking at the world than Irving does. Irving seems to be using it as a kind of superficial cladding that he's putting over the more authentic reality of day-to-day -day life. And he's using presentation and performance as a model to understand everyday relationships. I think you could take it a step further and say that everyday relationships are nothing but performance. So Irving is interested in sign vehicles, which are really just another word for presentations of the self. Like you, you use sign vehicles in his model to represent status like wealth or age or class. And he's constantly reminding us that these sign vehicles are inadequate, that they don't refer to our interior experience, that they're just a partial expression of what's going on inside of us. Irving, and I think Alberti as well, are really going out of their way to remind us that the self as experienced by others isn't the self as experienced by the self. And this can be our point of access for deconstructing Irving's theory of self-presentation. Where Irving says that the real self is never seen, and that any presentations of the self are inadequate, that's where we can put our postmodern pry bar and start to apply pressure. If Irving's right that the real self is never perceived, then in the presentation of the self, there's an inherent and critical contradiction. At our most visible, when we're most presented, we are also most unseen. Irving assumes this core of authenticity at the center of our being that presentation attempts to and fails to represent. But what if there is no core at the center of our being? What if we've all lost ourselves like Achilles and we've become our armor? If someone else puts on our skin and presents themselves as us, there might not be any difference between us and that presentation. This idea of an authentic, singular, internal self is a daydream. At our core, we're nothing but a void. We're an empty shell. And if there is anything inside of us, if there is anything inside this shell, it's just an inky abyss and a trip into the self. A, a journey of self-discovery is really just a free fall into the void. So let's talk briefly about a particular case study that Irving works with, where he's talking about uh, an island off the coast of the UK that used to be a small farming community, but now it makes more money as a kind of tourist destination. So he talks about a particular family on the island who own a small farming estate, you know, a few houses, a few fields, and they used to make their money as farmers, but for the past five years or so, they've been making all their money as hotel owners because they have the beds and they're just, their property is more profitable as a hotel. So these are people who grew up as farmers, they're rough working class people, and now for the past five years, they've been tending to middle class sensibilities clean sheets, down comforters, soft beds, good food, you know, clean clothes, proper hygiene, all the middle class trappings that one would come to expect from a chic hotel manager. Now, Irving says in the beginning, this was a presentation. The farmers were actively presenting themselves to their clients as middle class personalities in an attempt to make the customers feel more comfortable. But over time, Irving says, this presentation became reality. The farmers, after performing a middle-class lifestyle for long enough, eventually became what they were pretending to be. This is indicative that there really isn't anything essential inside of us, and presentations are all we are. So Irving says about this middle-class couple, for the last four or five years, the island's tourist hotel has been owned and operated by a married couple of farmer origins. From the beginning, the owners were forced to set aside their conceptions as to how life ought to be led, displaying in the hotel a full round of middle-class services and amenities. Lately, however, it appears the managers have become less cynical about the performance that they stage. 
They themselves are becoming middle class and more and more enamored of the selves their clients impute to them. So Irving is confusing the directionality of self-presentation. In the beginning of his text, he says that we present ourselves to the other. But in this instance, he's saying that the way that other people perceive us changes the way that we see ourselves. And this is the last deconstructionist kind of turn that we're going to make with Irving. He says that when an individual appears before others, he wittingly and unwittingly projects a definition of the situation of which a conception of himself is an important part. So to make my argument a little more clear, we could replace the word conception with preconception, which I think Irving would say is fair. We, we go into social situations in Irving's model with an understanding of who we are, and then we present that, like we have a script that we've written interiorly, and then when we meet someone, we read that script to them. He's reminding us that a conception or a preconception of ourself is critical to a presentation of ourself. But I think we could take this a step further, although Irving would probably disagree, and we could say that a presentation of the self creates a conception of the self, which I think was the case with those farmers. So Irving and Alberti are really privileging the interior over the exterior. They're saying that our inner self is more authentic than our presentation of that inner self to others. But as I've suggested, there may not be an inner self at all. And if all we are is presentation... And the only certainty in our existence is this presentational relationship with the other, where we show ourselves to them and they reaffirm our existence by watching us. Our inner self only exists as a presentation to other people. What if we aren't real until we're seen? Now, this hierarchy in, in Irving, where presentation is underneath... Um, originality underneath interior experiences is a form of representational hierarchy, right? So you have the original self, and then you have the representation of the self. Now, if we use representational terminology, we can start to tie Irving into Derrida, who provides us with tools to deconstruct hierarchies like this. In Derrida's case, what he's focused on is speech over text, the idea that speech is original and text is representational, that speech is superior to text. Now, the same tools that Derrida uses to undermine this hierarchy and to question this privileging, we can use in Irving to deconstruct his privileging of self-presentation over the interior self-experience. So for Derrida, original speech, like self-sustaining speech, is like that of a king or a judge. It legislates as it speaks. It brings into being that which it's talking about. It's, it's performative, to use a Surlian term. It's a performative speech act. It, it brings something into being as it speaks. It's sovereign language. It's self-controlling. It's in control of its environment. But this becomes a problem as soon as this language is written down. As soon as this speech is represented with the written word, there's a secondary original, and that undermines the supremacy of the first original. This puts original speech in a position where it has to sublimate the written word as much as possible. And that, I think that corresponds to what Irving is doing with presentations of the self and to what Alberti is doing with presentations of the self on the internet. There's this desperate suppression going on. They're all desperate to say that the real world is above the virtual world, that the representation and repetition is lesser than originality. This also ties into the internet um, in that you have presence and absence online, right? We, pri we privilege a, a material presence, the presence of another person, and we sublimate, we suppress the virtual presence or the absence of another person. We can't really see without these postmodern tools that the absence of another person 
virtually, if we're virtually experiencing their absence and talking to them via text message or over Skype, that's a that's an absence in the modern assessment of things, but it's also very much a presence. So contaminating these two ideas, absence, presence, virtual, original, they can bring us closer together in the modern world. We're lonely in the modern world. Alberti is absolutely right. We're not communal. We're not together. We're focused on individuality and uniqueness. But we're also profoundly connected in a way that we've never been in human history. The internet has tied us together in a way that really no one could have ever imagined in the past. But we're super lonely, despite this uh, connection to each other. So this contradiction might stem from old expectations of what community is. If we're clinging to an old model of togetherness that's now obsolete, that might explain why we're so lonely. The family or the clan, like we talked about a few videos ago, it's dead or it's dying. It's becoming vestigial. Like it doesn't matter anymore. The new model of togetherness is mass visibility. It's not small units of people. Which brings us back to the famous who are a great model for mass visibility and self-presentation to a mass audience. And realizing that self-presentation is the modern form of self-creation and that all relationships are presentational should show us that the famous aren't that different from the rest of us. They represent a modern mass form of self-presentation and self-creation. They might do it in extremists. They might be an extreme example of modern self-creation, but they're still using the same tools that everyone else is. The famous are like the rest of us. They're straddling this barrier between visibility and invisibility. Like the fan man, we are all stuck in a third space between the audience and the stage. And third space really might be a misnomer in this case, because this might be the only space that's available to any of us. So I want to close with another Eastern Taoist mystic, uh, Chang Zhu. Uh, he has that very famous poem that I'm sure you've heard about how he dreamt he was a butterfly. Let's go through one translation of it reasonably quickly. Uh, Once Chang Zhu dreamed he was a butterfly, a fluttering butterfly. What fun he had. Doing as he pleased, he did not know he was Zhu. Suddenly he woke up and found himself to be Zhu. He did not know whether Zhu had dreamed he was a butterfly or a butterfly had dreamed he was Zhu. Between Zhu and the butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is what is meant by the transformation of things. So let's talk about those last two lines because I think they're not very often quoted when people talk about this poem, and I think they are very, very interesting. So you might think that this distinction between butterfly and human works against a postmodern reading of this poem. But the dreamer didn't say that he knew when he was dreaming that he was dreaming and that he knew when he was awake that he was awake. All they're drawing a distinction between is butterflies and people. The poem still leaves it ambiguous whether or not it's a butterfly dreaming it's a person or a person dreaming it's a butterfly. There might be a distinction between those two things, but there isn't a clear distinction between representation and reality. Virtuality and materiality are contaminated in this poem. And the last sentence, this is what is meant by the transformation of things, I think that's extremely postmodern. It leaves things open to change. You could be a butterfly one day and a person the next. And it's not a privileging. You're not saying that you're dreaming that you're a butterfly, therefore you're not a butterfly. You're, it's saying that when you think you're a butterfly, you are a butterfly. It's privileging presentation over materiality. If, and it might even be dismissing materiality entirely and only giving us presentation. The only thing Chang Zhu knows is what he sees, is what he presents and what the world presents to him. So this approach to virtuality and representation, I think, is really useful to modern online persons.
As we make ourselves in virtual spaces more and more, I think we need to be disregarding these materialistic approaches to reality, to this idea that the physical, that the immediate presence of the other are superior to the absence of the other and their virtual presentation. Anyway, just something to think about. Uh, Thanks for tuning in. This is The Theory Creep. I'm The Theory Creep. And we'll see you next time.